The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Jason Hart. James asked the question, why are there fightings and quarrels among us? What brings up these fights? What brings up these disagreements? God's desire is that harmony would exist within His church. That there would be harmony among the heirs of heaven. But He also understands that the church is made up of people. We are human beings and we are imperfect. Now, His church is perfect. It's His scheme to redeem mankind. It's His kingdom with, within the walls of that kingdom that we find security and we find refuge, refuge from the wrath of God, security under the Spirit of God. But God also knows that it happens to be inhabited by imperfect people. And so because of that, we recognize that occasionally there will be disagreements among us. There will be some differences of opinion. There will be times that I will disagree with you and you will disagree with me. There will be times that my opinion of certain matter is not going to be on par with your opinion of the matter. And the same is true all all the way across the board. Look at the person sitting next to you. I doubt that you would agree with everything. Sometimes you would agree just to disagree. But sadly, there are also times when God understands. It's not to say that He likes it. But He knows that there will be times when there will be individuals within the church who will be deceptive. That there will be some who would desire to divide the body of Christ for whatever horrible reason it might be. That there would be somebody who would sow discord among the brothers. Perhaps there is an agenda to try to push. Whenever anyone finds themselves with that sort of ambition within their life, what we recognize about that individual is that they have developed a defective interest in Christ. Their interest in Christ, their interest in the kingdom, is not of purity and soundness anymore, but it's one that is defective. There are also other defective qualities that you find within those who are following Jesus as well. And these are not always the type of characteristics or qualities about a person that would try to divide the body of Christ, but they certainly exist. There is a book that I have been reading back and forth from time to time for about, I'd say, two months now. It was written by Kyle Eidelman, called Not a Fan. We have several copies of that back in our library. There are three, I know there are three copies of the book Not a Fan, and then there are also a couple of teen editions. Basically, they're, same, they're the same book, just the use of different terminologies. In the very first chapter of that book asks the question, are you a fan or are you a follower? Are you a fan or are you a follower? Are you a fan of Jesus? Jesus interests you. You're excited about Jesus. You think that He's someone that is pretty special. And so you are a follower, or you are a fan. You see, really more of what we're doing right now as being somewhat of a a stadium. 
All of Jesus' fans are together and we're all cheering and we're all excited about being fans of Jesus. But then there are those They're interested in Jesus as well, but their interest is far deeper. These are the individuals who are followers. They're not following Jesus because of the comforts that Jesus provides. They're following Jesus because that is their intent, that is their desire, that is their commitment. And for several weeks now, we will be asking some questions that are very similar to this with some different responses. In some cases, it will be the question, are you a fan or are you really a follower? Today, our question, our main question is, what is your value as a disciple? If you were to take a chance to step back and evaluate your own life, your own soul, and the way that you are following Jesus, how would you value that discipleship? You know, if it's possible that you could put a price tag on it, how would you rate it? How would you determine the value of your following of Jesus? Today I'll offer you two different answers. It's either one or the other. You either sit in this chair or you sit in this chair. Your value as a disciple? You're either defective, like a fan, when the going gets tough, you up out of the chair. Whenever you decide to keep continue to follow Jesus, you hop back into the comfortable chair. As long as Jesus' ways are in harmony with your ways, rather than you trying to be in harmony with the way that Jesus wants you to move. Or you can decide for yourself, am I effective? Am I a productive disciple in Christ? Am I following Him because I truly believe that He is the Lord? That He has the words of eternal life? I have believed and I have even come to a greater certainty that He is the Holy One of God. There is no one else to whom I would rather go than to Jesus Himself. And it's okay if it's not comfortable. It's okay if there's not a lumbar support. Because all I do need is to be a true follower of Jesus. As we look throughout the New Testament and we take a look into characters who were a part of God's New Testament church, we do recognize that there were five individuals that there's not much information about. But as we look at these five individuals, we'll recognize these as individuals who had defective interest. Now, it could be at one time that these were individuals who were true followers of Jesus. But because the devil, knowing their lust, knowing their desires, knowing their appetites, was able to lure them into a different type of discipleship of Jesus, one that was not true, one that was not real, one that was based on comfort and their likes and their desires, rather than following Jesus. Our very first example is a man by the name of Demas. Now, just like all of the characters of our study today, there's not much that we know about Demas. When we look into a few passages, this is what we recognize about Demas. According to Philemon, verse 24, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, 
Demas was a man who was a companion of Paul and Luke. He was an individual who at one time was following Jesus. He was a Christian. He was evangelistic. Traveling right alongside of Paul and Luke on their evangelistic missions. He was an individual that had been embraced by the church. He was an individual that was entrusted by Christians then. But another passage of Scripture tells us, this is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul sadly said, Demas has deserted me for love of this present world. Demas abandoned the cause of Christ because his interests were in the things of the world and not as a true follower of Jesus. As far as we know, he wasn't even sitting in this seat anymore. His defective interest caused him to chase after and become a disciple of the world instead of being a disciple of Jesus. When we look into 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, John tells us all that is in the world is not of the Father, but is of the world. And he tells us what those things are. He tells us the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those things are not of the Father, but they are of the world. Those are defective interests. It's the appetites of the eye, what appears pleasant to the eye. It's the appetites of the flesh, what feels pleasurable to the flesh. There is the appetite of the soul, the, the, the desire of the things that are materialistic. And it doesn't have to be just money. It can be possessions. But our appetites and our cravings are given more toward the things that are of the world than our cravings toward God. Now, brethren, can we truly say that we love God and do not love the world? If truly our interest and our appetites are reserved for the things that are worldly rather than the things that are of God. How often do we find ourselves kneeling in prayer, closing our prayers, Father, we love you. How often do we sing songs of praises? Oh, how I love Jesus. And we can sing all, with kind, all kinds of confidence. Jesus loves me, this I know. Because that's what the Bible tells us. That is true. We can always count on it. But what about that song? Oh, how I love Jesus. Can we sing that song in truth and harmony as long as we are sitting in a defective chair? As long as our appetites are given toward the world, as long as our cravings are given to the world instead of to the Lord. How can we say that we love God when we treat the, the world as our supper and we treat God as a condiment? Oh, we'll take a little bit of the world and we will dip it in the sauce of God and all of a sudden it becomes sweet tasting. It's, it's pleasurable. It's comfortable. God does just, just a little bit of icing on the cake. We treat the world as our meal, but we treat God as a dessert. After I've experienced all of that, that I can experience in the world, I've had a wonderful week. I've had a week with my family and with my job and with my friends and, and my relationships and, and all the things that are of the world. And right here at the end, 
I think I'll have just a little sliver of dessert just to finish off the course. Folks, God is not an appetizer. And maybe that's the way that we treat Him sometimes when we think of Sunday, our little hour, a moment. We come and we worship God and, and we say, God, oh, how I love you. We get our little appetizer for the week and then we treat the entire week as the meal for life. This is our supper and we fill up to where our bellies are over flowing to where just stuffed on the things that are of the world. So how's your appetite? How would you describe your appetite for God? Which of the two chairs would you sit in? Is it defective? With a love for this present world. Are you truly effective? Saying, God is my meal. He is my supper. He is my appetite. He is my craving. He's not just a small sliver. It's not just a little additive. Not just a little salt or a little pepper. Spice that gives zeal to life. He is my life. And I follow Him, not the world. Our next individual that I want us to discover is a man by the name of Diotrephes. If you would turn your Bibles over to 2 John. The books of 2nd and 3rd John are intriguing books. Many times they get overlooked because they are such short. I said 2nd John, 3rd John is where I would like for us to go. Sometimes we overlook these books because they're so small. Jude is another one right there next to them. We just sort of overlook those. You know, if Philemon is one, it's a one chapter book. That's just one chapter, you know, what kind of information can we find in those? Folks, these chapters are flooded with information. Uh, you could spend months upon months just studying these one chapter books and come away with an incredible amount of knowledge and it will lift up your spirit while also providing a wonderful examination. These books, these one chapter books are all very self-examination oriented books. But in 3 John, in verses 9 through 10, we find some information about this man by the name of Diotrephes. Just like, Nick, uh, just like Demas, we would recognize him as a man who had an interest for Jesus. And very possibly, he was a man at one time was a true follower of Jesus. We can't be a judge of that. Some would say that Diotrephes was even a leader within the church, possibly an elder. Now, we don't know that. But because of the position that he seems to hold, he seems to be a person of some sort of influence. But let's take a look at verses 9 through 10. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I, so if I come... I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. He was refusing to welcome missionaries. He was refusing to be hospitable to those who were being helpful to the church of God. He was even refusing and ejecting those who were receiving such brothers. He was ejecting them out of the church. He wasn't even acknowledging the, the apostleship of John. 
This Diotrephes was a man who had a defective interest. He was ruining the church. And what was the key note here? What was the key characteristic that John considered to be the quality of his defectiveness? He loved to have the preeminence. He loved to be considered first. What's interesting about the word preeminence or preeminent is that the Holy Spirit inspired His, the writers of the New Testament to write the words that we have before us and only one other time in all Scripture is the word preeminent used. It's found in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 18, there it says, Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. There is only one individual that God has ever given the right, the privilege, and the responsibility to be preeminent. And that is His only Son. He's the head of the church in all things. He is first above anything else. Diotrephes, his desire, his defective interest was to be considered first above anything else. What was it that Jesus was always asking for us to seek? Humility. What was it that God continued to impress upon His New Testament church? The type of attitude that we should have? I would venture to guess that if you were to look through the epistles those writings that were being given to the churches to help them know and to understand how they should operate as congregations. You can hardly turn a page without there being a mention of humility. To the Corinthians, the warning was there. Be careful where you stand, lest you fall. Think about James. James says, humble yourselves in the sight of God. And He will lift you up. God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And how often do we see Jesus as He's walking along with His disciples, those who were following Him, who in the humility of their mind were following Jesus to consider Him greatest above all other things. But even they had trouble with defective interest. They wanted to know who is, who is the greatest, who can sit ne- down next to you. So Jesus many times had to rebuke them. He had to teach them and encourage them the attitude of humility. It's not always easy to be humble though, is it? Sometimes we like to be thought of first. We not only like the comfort of sitting in a chair like this, but we like it because it's, it's pretty. It's, well, this chair maybe is not pretty. But it's interesting. It stands out. It's blue. Which one of these two chairs would you want to sit in? We'd want to sit in the chief seats, wouldn't we? We'd want to sit in the, we'd want to sit in the type of chair that when people look at it, say, oh, I want to sit in a chair like that. 
That's a whole lot more comfortable than a chair like that over there. So our following Jesus is, is really comfort. It's how we would appear to others. It's how we want others to, to envy what we have and the chair that we have. Folks, I'm going to tell you something about going out in the world and showing po folks that we are sitting in this chair. We sit in a chair like this and we tell the world, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus or, I, or I'm a fan of Jesus. He's interesting to me. And I'm excited about it. Won't you come and get a chair like this? There's no wonder why multitudes of people in the world look at us and say, you hypocrite. You talk about this Jesus. You think you're so excited about this Jesus. But you're filled with hypocrisy. We wouldn't, want people, we wouldn't want people to come and sit in this chair anyway. Even if we could flash it in front of them and say, Hey, look here. Look what you can sit in if you become a Christian. Look what you can have. Look at all that you can have. Folks, don't you remember that was one of the temptations of the devil to Jesus? You bow down before me and look at all that you can have. And we use the exact same thing to try and draw people into Jesus. Instead of teaching them and training them to be true disciples. Are you sitting in a chair like this though? Where you're truly effective, where you are humble. It doesn't bother you that when people look at the chair they think, that doesn't look comfortable. It's not appealing. It's not nice. It's, it's just plain. How would you describe your humility to Christ? Is it defective? Or is it effective? Those who are defective believers also love to create problems. Three individuals by name, Alexander, Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus, Philetus. These were individuals who were consciously reckless. When we look into 1 Timothy chapter 4, we recognize Alexander and Hymenaeus. A little bit later in 2 Timothy, you read about Philetus. You also read about a man by the name of Alexander the coppersmith. These were individuals who have shipwrecked the faith. They turned many away from the faith. They have swerved from the faith. These were individuals that seemed to love to create problems. I wish we had more time to really talk about these, but what I think is interesting My, my experience has been that many people who love to create problems, they do so in the name of Christ. Something doesn't go their way. They're not quick to hear, but rather they are quick to speak. They're quick to wrath. And in order to justify this wrath, in order to justify their impatience, they stand back behind the cross of the Lord and start throwing stones. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. They lost the love of Christ. Turning the church upside down. Destroying the faith of some. Swerving from the faith themselves. 
and they're reckless. And don't get me wrong, there is a very right place for strong exhortation and at times rebuke. But when we do so, we must be sure, we must be concerned that we are doing it with the right spirit of love and compassion, tenderness and gentleness, even in firmness, to be sound in the heart. Our last question. How would you describe your creativity for Christ? What are you creating? How are you productive? Whenever you consider, whenever you examine your discipleship, as you think about your following along with Jesus and desiring to follow His ways and and His works, where is your creativity? Is it to create problems? Or is it to create discipleship? Folks, I can tell you this. Our desire may not be to create problems within the church. But if we're not being creative to make disciples, Problems in the church will arise. How many times have you heard those words, an idle mind is the devil's workshop? An idle church is what? The devil's workshop. So, which are you? Are you defective or are you effective? You'll see these chairs occasionally. I might even get a nicer chair than this one. I had a nicer chair planned, but it was broken. So what is your value of as a disciple? Are you defective or are you effective? Which chair would you sit in? Now, in thinking about the illustration and thinking about the text and thinking about these individuals, I would imagine that, that if we were to go one by one and ask, which chair do you want to sit in? Well, I'll say, I don't want to sit in this chair right here. Because that's the chair I'm supposed to sit in. That's the chair that Jason said that we're supposed to sit in. But is that the chair that you're sitting in now? Some of you may be thinking, oh, I'm sitting down here on one of these steps. I can hop over here to this chair when things are going the way that I like for them to, or I can hop over here to get in this chair. It doesn't work like that, does it? Because there is no middle ground. I say, oh, well, I kind of lean in the direction of... No, that doesn't work either. You're either de- effective or defective. So the question I want to ask you this morning, which chair are you sitting in now? Ask that question while we stand and sing this song. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words in